This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Alliance and Transition, the Philippine-American Relationship, question mark. And our guest is uh, a, a frequent guest to uh, Asian Review, Carl Baker, who is the Executive Director at Pacific Forum. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Bill. In fact, it's been a, a couple of years since we've done the Philippines here. In, right, in right. We're yeah. due. We're long overdue. That's right. We're long overdue. Well, let's get at it. Um, from one perspective, uh, the Philippine relationship has been close. Philippine-American relationship has been close. But from another one, the Philippine-American relationship has been characterized as a love-hate relationship. So where do you fall? Yeah, well, I, I, I fall right, right in the middle of that. And, you know, it's a fraught relationship over the years. And, and it's uh, partly because of the, the colonial relationship that the United States had early in the century. I think there's a lot of historical memory about uh, what happened in the early 1900s and late 1800s uh, when, when the U.S. first, first uh, occupied the Philippines, if you will. And, uh, you know, over the years they've, they've developed a, uh, a, an alliance relationship and, and certainly during World War II it was mm -hmm. a close relationship that has fostered a lot of, of long-term friendships and a lot of uh, long-term memories on both sides, I think. And then, you know, and then in the, in the, uh, in the 1990s when we went through the, the, the base issue with, uh, with the closing of Clark and Subic, I think there was a, a fairly dramatic shift in, in how at least the elite in the Philippines viewed the relationship with the, with the Americans. But again, because of the people-to-people -people relationships with, with the Filipinos that have moved to the United States and become American citizens, there's always been this long, long-standing, uh, close cultural relationship. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it is, yes, it's a, it's a relationship that, that blows hot and cold, but it's been fairly steadfast on the people-to-people -people level. What's changed, I think, is probably the government-to-government -government relationship based on, on how each side viewed the other in terms of its, its uh, commitment to the other's uh, security interests. Mm, mm, that's interesting. How about democracy? Does that help to hold the relationship together? Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that was always a strength uh, up until a couple of years ago. That, that certainly the United States always, seen, always saw the the Philippines as an important democracy, as an example of democracy. In fact, in some, in some respects, the Philippines was too much of a democracy where there, there wasn't uh, a, a, a well-structured uh, organizational approach to how you deal with democracy. And so it was kind of an open-ended, uh, the, the media was sort of wide open, difficult to control, and uh, you know, there, was, there was always this concern with the extrajudicial killing of, mm. of the press because of its openness, because of its sort of Wild West attitude towards news collection and things like that. So, but democracy has been an important keystone, a cornerstone in, in the relationship between the Philippines and the United, and the United States, for sure. Mm. What, what do you think is the single most um, important factor that drives the Philippines and America apart? Well, I, and that's, a, that's a complicated question because I think what has driven them apart in, in recent years is the, the Philippines' frustration with the willingness of the United States to make firm security commitments to the Philippines. And by that, what I'm really saying is, you know, the Philippines has, has the issue in the South China Sea right. with, with China over the islands. And while the United States is prepared to make a security commitment to Japan to protect the Senkakus it, where, with the, the competition between Japan and China over that set of islands, it hasn't been willing to make that same sort of statement to the Philippines over the Philippine claims in the West Philippine Sea in Philippine terminology or in South China Sea in, in international terminology. And so I think the Philippines has felt a little bit frustrated with yeah. that. On the American side, on the other hand, I think there's a growing frustration with the Philippines' inability, unwillingness to develop true defense cap capacity on its own. Mm. And so the, the Americans have felt that, that they have provided a lot of support for the Philippine defense establishment, but that the Philippines has been unwilling or reluctant at least 
to, to actually take that assistance that the United States has provided and put it to good use. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. But isn't it true that one of the strongest connections between the Philippines and the United States is the folks in the Philippine defense establishment and the folks in the U.S. defense establishment? Yes, I, that's right. It, it is. In fact, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, with, with the introduction of, of President Duterte's sort of lambasting the United States for criticizing his human rights record, uh, one of the reasons that the, the relationship with the United States did endure is because there is a longstanding relationship at the, at the operational level between the U.S. Uh, defense establishment and the, and the Philippine defense establishment. So, so certainly, uh, Lauren Zana, the, the, the Secretary of Defense in the Philippines, has done a lot to maintain that relationship with the United States. And his staff and, and, the, and the, the military officers themselves mm. have done a lot to sort of maintain that military relationship, even in the context of, of rather, rather hostile exchanges between uh, President Duterte and, at the time, President Obama. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, President Rodrigo Duterte, and so we should really focus some attention on him generally perceived as anti-American. Do you agree with that or disagree? On a personal level, yes, he is. He, and, and, you know, and he has his history, you know, he, he thinks that the CIA is out to get him, you know, and he has a, a historical memory about a, a bad experience with, with, the, uh, with the Americans and specifically with, with the CIA in the Philippines. And so, and so he, he personally does, I think. But I think it's, it's a m mistake to say that, that he has is anti-American in his policies. Mm. Because I think what, what his, his policy intent is really to diversify Philippine defense relationships. And so what, what Duterte has tried to do is has tried to sort of wean the Philippines from sole dependence on the United States and has tried to be broader in his perspective by looking at how he can, he can use the relationships between the Philippines, Japan, China, Russia, to actually improve the Philippines' defense in a more uh, autonomous defense way. Defense or economic situation? I'm sorry? Defense or economic situation? Well, both. Okay. Both. But, but I mean, spot, talking specifically about defense, he, he sought okay. to, to sort of expand their defense relationships. And yes, part of that also then lends itself to a broader economic relationship, specifically with, with China. Mm. You know, I think that that's the real, the real cornerstone of, of, their, of the Philippines' relationship with China. is not so much the defense relationship, but the, the broader economic relationship, and then the defense relationship goes along with that. Could you say that uh, Duterte is like a lot of other leaders or countries in Asia? They want the security um, guarantee from the U.S., but want the economic benefits from China? Yeah, well, Sure, you could. Yeah, that's a way. That's a way to put it. But I think that that's a fairly American way of looking at what that relationship uh, is, uh -huh. because I think from from the Philippine perspective, I think the way it's viewed is we have to deal with China economically. We mm -hmm. really don't have a choice because China has become so important for the economic well-being in Asia mm -hmm. that it has become the export uh, market for a lot of products being produced in the Philippines because the Philippines. You know, 60, almost 70 percent of their exports are actually electronic components that are mostly shipped into China for mm -hmm. assembly and then off to the, off to the, the, the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they have to have an economic relationship with China. And so, so you have to start from that premise. And then I think when you, when you talk about the, the looking for America as a, as a security guarantee, I think is, is not necessarily accurate. And I think that's what Duterte really represents, is he's, he's suggesting, no, we don't need to be solely dependent on the United States. In fact, it's unhealthy to be solely dependent on the United States, and that's why he wants to expand his defense relationship. So, so yes, they want to have American security presence, and they would also like to have more engagement from the United States economically. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact is, is that they are dependent on China because the United States, in my view, hasn't done a particularly good job of, of integrating itself into the Southeast Asian economies. So it's not quite as simple as saying everybody wants the U.S. security guarantee and wants the economic relationship with China. I think in Southeast Asia, it starts with the reality that your economic well-being depends on China 
and then what else can you do to, to, to sort of buffer yourself from Chinese complete, complete domination by China? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in Asia would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not just the Philippines, no, but no. a lot of people throughout yeah. Asia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, the Russian angle, how does that work? Uh, was it the, uh, aren't the Russians uh, going to sell some planes to the Philippines? Well, it's, it's defense equipment. And defense more specifically equipment. today, it's, it's Russian submarines. 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 Okay. You know, and you have to wonder why, why all these countries in Southeast Asia want submarines, mm -hmm. why, why it's such an attractive uh, weapon for, for Southeast Asian countries, given, given the cost of operating submarines and sort of the inefficiency as, as a real uh, defense uh, weapon. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and part of it is because everybody else does it. You know, this, this is always a problem with, with defense equipment is if that guy has, has 10 airplanes, then I want 12. You know, and so, and so that, the submarine has sort of become the, the, the sine qua non of, of developed military <coughs> capability in, in Southeast Asia. And so the Philippines is the country that hasn't developed a submarine program. Mm. And so now uh, Duterte and, and the Philippines is looking at Russia to provide uh, a submarine. Kilo class. Yeah, yeah, kilo class submarines. And that sort of compares with what the Vietnamese have done, you know, what Malaysia is trying to do and Indonesia is trying to do with, with developing a, a submarine capability. <coughs> so so that's, that's the latest thing. But it's a broader, it's a broader issue, again, with, with the Philippines trying to diversify its, its, its resource base for defense equipment. And, and the Russians do make defense equipment, and the Russians are very aggressive in trying to develop those those defense related markets because Southeast they have Asian markets. in the south in southeast asia in particular mm, yeah. interesting well uh, this is a bit of a deviation but sitting here listening to you um you know bring us up to date on the philippines it, it, it occurs to me that um you know in 1945 or 47 i forget the exact year when the philippines got independence from the united states it was seen as kind of the model country in southeast asia Philippines and Burma, and they both fell on hard times. Why exactly, in your view, did the Philippines not really live up to that, everyone's hope? I, I suppose th there's, there's any number of reasons. Um, I personally think that a big part of the problem is that they were never able to complete a meaningful land reform program. That was my guess, but I wanted to hear it from you. Yeah, well, there you heard it. You know, and so when you, when you look at, at what happened in, in Korea, for example, you know, you had a very serious land reform movement right. in, in the 1950s. Right. And you saw the same thing in Taiwan. You had the right. same, you had same thing, different, different versions of it in, in, Japan, other, in, in, in Japan, in other Southeast Asia countries. And, and the Philippines was never able to do that. And so you've always had these, this, this big difference between the very rich, the, the land the land-owning mm -hmm. class, and the rest of the Philippines. And so I think that's a, that's a part of the problem. Uh, you know, and you could certainly say that, uh, you know, more, more technically, I think in, in the economic sphere, you had problems with, with people being willing to reinvest in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So the tendency in the Philippines has always been to sort of offshore money mm -hmm. and, and to, to, to not reinvest in, in capital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, of course, the infrastructure in the Philippines always suffered. You know, I remember, you know, when I first went to the Philippines in the 1970s, they were building a road, you know, from, from Manila up north. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember going down this road, watching them, you know, one pile driver driving piles through the rice field. And I went back two years, three years later, and that truck had moved up the road about 20 miles, still, piling, still driving piles into the rice field. You know, by the time they had wow. gotten the last pile wow. driven, the, the, the ones up on the other end had rotted away in the in the corrosive wow. uh, environment that it was sitting in. You know, so so when you compare that to how infrastructure was developed in the rest of Asia, right. it, it, it was remarkable. And and I think the reason for that was because there simply wasn't a willingness to to invest in serious infrastructure back in the '60s and '70s, or even the '50s. And so so that's I think another re another important reason. Mm. And it's one of the reasons now why I think people are excited about growth in the Philippines because they finally have access to capital for infrastructure development. Their roads are still woefully behind. So if everyone in the world I think knows about Edsa Epifanio de los Santos Avenue in Manila because it's a horrible road because once you're on it, you're on it for hours. Mm. 
you know, and, and it's just <laughs> almost unpassable because the traffic has gotten so bad. Wow. So, so, you know, I think that that's another important part, that they were just unable to develop infrastructure and unable to, to get capital investment that allowed them to, to actually develop their economy like some of the other countries. Mm, interesting, interesting. Well, I think this is a good time for us to take a break. Uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Carl Baker, Executive Director at Pacific uh, Forum. We're talking about the Philippine-American uh, uh, relationship, and uh, we'll be right back, so don't go away. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. みなさんこんにちは。ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお届けする今日週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティ、ハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組
have really been fairly careful in involving themselves in politics. They've really sort of stuck with, with their, their businesses and their, and their economic enterprises. But of course, you know, that influences the, the, the political system, but not directly. And so, so the, the Chinese play an important role, but it's an important role as, as a background, not as, not as the front of, of the political scene in the mm. Philippines. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Well, um, some people say that uh, Duterte is selling out uh, the Philippines' sovereignty in order to, you know, uh, glean favor with the Chinese, that he has not been as... Uh, uh, how should we say, uh, hasn't defended the interests of the Philippines when it comes to the South China Sea and those islands in the South China Sea? Yeah, yeah. And, there, and there is a growing amount of, of criticism of Duterte in the Philippines about, about what he's doing with or not doing in the South China Sea. But the, the fact is, is that he actually has done some things that he probably wouldn't have been able to had he followed Aquino's line of taking, you know, trying to, trying to get uh, the the uh, tribunal of 2016 uh, enforced with the Chinese, and so actually, what he, what he's been able to do is he has been able to, to build to build some capacity on islands that are occupied by the Philippines. So, for example, he's been able to actually improve the runway on the one island that the Philippines has that has a runway on, mm. and he has been able to set up some monitoring stations on some of the islands in in what the Philippines calls the West Philippine Sea, okay. which, is, which is well within the EEZ of the Philippines, but he has been able to make some of those improvements. So it's not completely fair to say that, that he has simply abdicated the, the, the region to the, to the Chinese. Mm. Having said that, you know, the Philippines comes back and they're also very critical of the United States mm -hmm. because they say, you know, if, if the United States was a good ally, they would have been much more aggressive early on to prevent the Chinese from taking these islands. Why wasn't the U.S.? Uh, well, I, I mean, that's, that's a question you'd have to ask the Obama administration, because that's really the, the administration that was in place when that all happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there was, there was this faith that the Chinese were not going to try to be, try to militarize. That was the promise that was made. And, and you know, it turns out that, in fact, they did militarize some of those right. installations. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's really interesting. So um, perhaps some of the Western press has been a little bit overly critical of him. Yeah, I think they have, and on, and I think that's why you you sort of see this disconnect between the international view that the Philippines is is in trouble and and the the view from within the Philippines that they've maintained a pretty good sense of of loyalty to to Duterte. You know, he mm -hmm. still is running sixty seventy percent. Uh, favorable ratings mm -hmm. in the Philippines, which is tough to do in that place. Filipinos tend to like these tough guy characters. Well, you could say that about Southeast Asia. I mean, there's, <laughs> okay. you know, I mean, that, that's not just, just, you think about it, not okay. just the Philippines. There's, okay. there's, a, there's a sense in, the, in Southeast Asia in general that they like a strong leader, you know, that they like a strong leadership. And, and there's different forms, but if you have, I mean, look at Mahathir, is back in Malaysia. Yeah, right, you, right, you know, right. Look at Hun Sen, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, look, that's, look at, that's look a at good what, example. What, that's what, a uh, very Thailand, example. Thailand is doing, you know, with, uh, with the, the, the military basically staying in power. So right. China, which is still, is still there. And so, you know, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a Southeast Asia uh, phenomena that we see a, a tendency to like a, a strong leader in, in power. Well, what do you think? Do you think there are, um, have there been assassination attempts on Duterte? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I think that there have been, been probably attempts, but there certainly hasn't been anything very, uh, there certainly hasn't been any close calls that have, okay. been, that have been in the news or anything. Okay. Uh, but I would, I would suspect that, uh, that uh, as with all presidents, there Do you are think he'll stay in office or do you think he'll get pushed out? Well, this is a big question of whether he's going to stay in office, but not so much because he's going to be pushed out, but because, his, because of his health. Mm -hmm. You know, he's given several indications that he himself doesn't actually want to serve until his term ends in 1920, oh, or, I have in 2022. Yeah, yeah and, and, and there's, you know, and he's disappeared from the public for extended periods uh, to suggest that, they, that he may have health problems. And so there's, there's talk, in fact, it just recently, there, there was talk that uh, he would step down tomorrow if it wasn't Lenny Robredo, his, his vice president, that would take over. Mm. You know, and so there was talk that uh, uh, just inside politics in the Philippines a little bit, uh, 
Ferdinand Marcos Jr. or Bong Bong Marcos, Bong Bong. you know, was was the challenger to Robredo in the in the vice president election, right. and he's still contesting that election. Right. And right, so, right, if he right. wins his 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 appeal, or if he wins his his case in court, then in fact he would become vice president. Then if some people have said Duterte would step aside so that Marcos could could take mm, take the presidency. That's really interesting. You know what occurs to me is as much as he Duterte bad mouths the U.S. at least from time to time, um, he, he, the situation in Marawi was only saved because of U.S. military advice. Well, this, the the U.S. certainly helped, and 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 by the way, that was a a big event. For the Philippines, that they saw that the Phil that the United States did in fact come to support them in Marawi. So it was it was really a a, a, a positive move and a positive uh, influence on the relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines. Mm. But the, if you ask the Filipinos, they quickly say, "But it was really the Australians that were most supportive." Really? Yeah. So it wasn't you know the United States got the got the media attention, but in fact in in the Philippines itself. There's a big recognition that Australia was also a very Australia faithful partner. Australia had advisors on the ground. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah they I actually provided that. support for that for that uh, okay. operation. Well, we're we're coming down to our last minute here, and um, so we're, we're uh, you know just sort of to get back to the theme of this show. Has there been a permanent change in the Philippine-American relationship? Well. I, I, I hate to say permanent because it's it's always an ebb and flow in the Philippine okay. U.S. relationship, and so you know there's talk now about about actually starting to implement the advance, ad, enhanced defense cooperation agreement, which was put in place during the Aquino administration, and and you know initially uh, Duterte had said he didn't want anything to do with it, but in fact now they've built their first facility. Uh, uh, up at uh, Basa Air Base in, in Pampanga, and now they're talking about doing more. And so, you know, so it looks like some of those things are coming back around. Mm. And so it sort of depends on what happens for the rest of Duterte's term. But I, I, I think there's a, a more positive tra trajectory today Great. than there was, uh, you know, when, when uh, D Duterte first came to power a couple of years ago. Great. Well, I guess we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, you're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today has been Carl Baker, Executive Director at Pacific Forum. We've been talking about the Philippine-American relationship. And uh, Carl, as always, is full of a lot of very interesting insight and really good information. See you the next time. Oh,